Okay, so welcome back everyone and let's continue with the second session with the title Successes and Failures of Liberal Democrats in Search of Political Renewal. My name is Eli Kuskevich, I'm one of the vice chairpersons of the Hungarian Europe Society. And uh, the second session will be slightly different than the first one because we will have a first presentation by Csaba Tóth, who is a political scientist, lawyer, and um, uh, right now, uh, senior partner of Mentat Consulting from Budapest. Uh, and after his presentation, there's a sh short Q&A immediately. So please address him with your questions uh, because he has to leave a bit earlier. And then three consecutive presentations just next, right after each other. And then a shorter Q&A uh, at uh, the end of the, of the second panel. Uh, if you don't mind, I will close the window because maybe it's a bit disturbing for the Zoom. Uh, thank you for the for those who are continuing our program via Zoom. Okay, thank you. So the first presentation is by uh, Chaba, uh, entitled "Political Innovations by Democrats." Uh, so Chaba, the floor is yours. Where do I have? To, I have to speak here, right? And there's a zoom on, so I cannot stand on. Yeah, I, I will try to be. Uh, I will try to give my presentation sitting down, then, which is uh, already a difficulty for me. And, and and thank you so much for this invitation. I am the worst of the presenters. I uh, came for my own uh, uh, speech, and I have to leave afterwards. I do apologize for that. And and, and I guess my only excuse is that uh, uh, Istvan knows I have been to many of these conferences, uh, and 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 I do know that um, you know very often. Uh, very often, after a while, you get uh, you get the impression that very often you you discuss some of the same issues, which is very much like what happens in politics. I think you try to reinvent the wheel, and that's certainly I think what we do here uh, in Hungary very often by uh, by discussing the same issues. So, so I do apologize, and that's one of the reasons I don't I don't go to some of these conferences uh, uh, as much. But Istvan convinced me that, uh, uh, that that I have to do this. I uh, <laughs> I uh, I, uh, I no longer. Uh, I'm in academics, so I have some practical experience. And what I would like to, to talk to you about, it's, it's, not, it's not even a presentation. It's just, just consider these some, some food for thought, consider these some maybe points to make when it comes to uh, innovation, when it comes to how we can have ideas about how to reform uh, our political system and indeed how to stand up uh, against autocrats, how to do politics and political communication, maybe in a way that will be uh, more successful in the future. Uh, I do not remember uh, if it was Istvan or I who chose the title and what I should be talking about when, when it comes to political innovation by Democrats. But immediately afterwards, I realized uh, that there are basically two, two problems with, these, with this title that we chose. First of all, and I will discuss this, political innovation, I think, in our countries is mainly done by non-democratic non people, by the other side. And you know, Democrats, liberals, who they are, and that's, that's the other very difficult question. So I will start by addressing some of the problems I see with innovation. Then I will give sort of some advice or some takes on, uh, on what we can do. And I will have three specific innovative ideas that I have read about or listened to uh, uh, over the course uh, uh, of the last years. All of these ideas sound, you, you can choose bold or ridiculous. Uh, uh, none, of them, uh, none of them have penetrated the discussion, but maybe it's, it's worth talking a bit about. So, so I see three problems with, with when we talk about innovation. And what is innovation? Of course, we can. Uh, uh, we can talk in depth about that, what it means in politics, but um, I think when we talk about political innovation, so not innovation in a way of technical innovation, not in a way of using a new tool, not in a way of being more savvy in social media, but actually having new political ideas, political ideas that might result in a paradigm shift in politics. I think many of these ideas come not from us, but from the other side. Uh, one and, and one of, I think, the key political innovations in Hungary by Fidesz, and, and you can call this, you can also call this lying, by the way, but I call it political innovation, was when, when in, back in 1998, I think, uh, uh, Fidesz started communicating in a way that said, even though there have been an expert understanding of politics, politics is able to achieve things that have not been thought possible before. I remember a very famous uh, discussion or debate between uh, Mr. Viktor Orban and Mr. Dula Horn, the then prime minister, which talked about the economic, uh, economic growth. 
And Fidesz had a promise in 1998, which said, we will sort of introduce economic growth of 7%. Now, of course, you cannot introduce economic growth in any way. But the underlying notion that they had in the debate was when Mr. Dula Horn talked about, well, you know, it's ridiculous. You cannot introduce economic growth. That's not something you can say. And Fidesz didn't, and Viktor Orban just said, you see, that's the difference between our approach. Because I believe that if we have a mandate to do something and we want to try to do something, then we should do that and we should not be let the expert opinion, and you can, of course, uh, look at it in different ways, the expert opinions say what we can and we cannot achieve. And of course, the content of that is, it's not something I really agree with. And the content of that might be ridiculous, but if you look at it over and over uh, in the course of the governing of Fidesz, it's a theme that comes to get, comes up very often. I also remember, and, and some, of, some in the room I sh I'm sure also do, that before 2010, Oh, when Fidesz comes into power, the foreign is going to collapse because simply these things they want to do, they just cannot do. They cannot have building so many stadiums in Hungary because there's just not the money to do that. They cannot reform this because there's just not the money to do that. And then they came in and they did that. Now, in a way, that is political innovation. The notion, uh, or you call, can call it voluntarism, right? Political voluntarism. But that is a way to, 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 to talk about politics in a different way. Uh, I think our side, sort of the, the, the liberal side, and I will discuss liberals and Democrats in just a second, uh, is now in a very defensive position, which I think is a very alien position uh, instinctively for liberals, right? Liberals arose from being skeptics, from challenging authority, challenging ideas. And very often, liberals now find themselves in having to say arguments like, well, we know the European Union is not good enough, but it's still the best we have. Well, this is something that simply cannot be done. Well, the political system we live in now, with all its flaws, is still the best political system we have. All these ideas, all these notions are very defensive, and they are, I, I'm sure you've had some of these discussions, you always had that, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not a good position to be in. Liberals, I think, are, 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 are better when challenging, uh, uh, challenging some of these decisions. So that's my first problem. Uh, with innovation. The second problem uh, is innovation is often the first time not really useful. It only comes to use after many, after many attempts. And I answer my own question of why I'm here. And that's, I think, because uh, before the, 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 the last election in Hungary, uh, I was involved in introducing the sort of primary election system into Hungary, which was seen as a political innovation and which resulted in having a joint um, joint candidate for the Hungarian election, which of course was Mr. Peter Markizai, who, um, let's just say, lost the election. Uh, and very often, of course, now people say, well, so if this primary system, which was such a big innovation, produced to us Peter Markizai, who probably had a worse result than someone else might have had, is that not a legitimate criticism? Does that not mean that we should throw political innovation and the primary system out of the window? And when, 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 when preparing for this, I was, I was trying to find a good analogy for that. And, and I think I found one which will uh, be comprehensible to people my age, over 40 and, and, and to the rest. If you remember, we used to have the television sets where you had to manually put uh, on which channel, which channel you will have. So number one, you had to like manually input it. And then the, the new innovation, you just had to push a button and then everything just sort of got set up. But when it did that, Suddenly, the Hungarian television one was no longer on channel one. The, the Hungarian television two was no longer on channel two. That was a big problem. And very often you said, well, maybe, maybe this is not such a good innovation. Maybe I should go back to how we did that before, because it just confuses things in a way and doesn't result in me actually having a better experience. Now, obviously, if we had stuck to that thought, it would still be manually adjusting it. It would be very difficult. Uh, to deal with cable TV today. But, but very soon, it, it, the problems arose. I mean, the primary system, uh, and I am not here to discuss this, which is, of course, a way of selecting the prime ministerial candidate via direct elections, is not a good system. If I might be as bold as to paraphrase Churchill, it's probably the worst system that's been found out to have a joint opposition candidate, except for all the others that have been tried. Uh, because in the end of the day, you need a system to do that. Uh, and also, if you don't have good channels on the television, no matter how you adjust them manually or by the remote, you're not going to have good program, right? But the program itself does not depend on the method by which you select that program. But very often, I mean, I mean, it's of course common sense. Innovation is not necessarily a good thing in the first in the in the first instance. And of course, the third one, uh, and I will I, I will share an anecdote with you there uh, that I had with with a, with a, with, a, with a member of Momentum Party which was when we discussed like one year after the election, momentum for those of you who don't know, promised 
great ideas, we will change politics, we will bring hope to the political system, we will change everything that's going on in Hungary. And I said, well, you know, really, you didn't change it? I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I read about Kennedy and Barack Obama, they also talked about changing things in Washington and hope, and they seem not to have changed everything. And I said, well, such a cynicism, and, and that's why I turned away from politics, because, you know, it's such, and I, and I said to, to that person, I mean, yes, but I mean, it's good that it was Kennedy and not Nixon, right? It was good that it was not Obama. It was Obama and not Trump, right? It's good that you have, in my understanding, that you have momentum. The fact that you cannot achieve everything of your visionary ideas should not lead you to abandon innovation, to abandon politics. Accepting the laws of politics, the rules of politics, accepting that politics has its own logic uh, and you cannot always change it overnight should not, I believe, lead us to believe that we should abandon it once our efforts fail. And I, that's, I think, uh, what we sometimes do. So that's, that's my problem with, with, with how we approach it. And then, then what are some of my, uh, uh, some of my suggestions or, or what, what we can do uh, as innovation? Now, very often, I think, what, what then liberals do uh, is they try to measure find out, survey, tackle, and use all the best tools available to us, non-political tools, tools available to us, media, let's buy media, try to use tools in our arsenal to try to have a message that will be competitive with the populist message. And I think what we all, almost always end up there uh, is we end up with sound, usually fairly acceptable policies that are just not exciting enough for people. And that leads us to the same notion of being defensive rather than voicing bold ideas and having those bold ideas uh, go out into the population. I'm sure you've all heard some of these arguments. Well, if we say that and that, that's very unpopular. My favorite uh, these days, if, and, and again, sorry for, for being, but it could be not just moment to any party. If we stand up too much for Ukraine, then it's not going to be popular because the majority, you know, majority of Hungary, the, the worst, the most hated country, Hungary, Russia, second Ukraine, right? Uh, Mr. Zelensky's popularity is just a, a, a bit above Mr. Putin's, uh, while of course he's the people who know him are, are, are much fewer. So, so Ukraine is not popular. Let's not do that in any way. But then you ask, are you realistically thinking that there is an opposition voter is already your voter and going to abandon you because you're too strong in your advocacy for Ukraine? I mean, I don't, I don't see that happening. But of course, that's what we would get from some of those groups, some of those polls. And that's, I think, how innovation dies. Innovation dies in focus groups. I'm sure you've, you've, many of you have heard that and, and, and might be familiar with the old argument of the Sony Walkman when they first tested it and said, well, why would I want to listen to music Why I walk? That's just stupid, right? That's, who, who, who would want to do that? The quality would be worse. Let's just go home and listen to our music. And of course, if they had done that, uh, uh, you, you would not have many of these ideas. Uh, as they asked the political party, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of um, a saying in Hungary, I don't know if it's true, maybe it's trying you know it, that they abandoned the word polgar uh, because of focus group results, which was, of course, the word uh, that Fidesz later used to win the election. Uh, so very often, while I think I, I am a big fan of, of, of researching, a big fan of measuring, a big fan of using data, but data itself, new technologies themselves, will not solve innovation. And I think the key there is that you go back to where you started from, and that is innovation, I think, should mean political innovation. Technological innovations come and go technological innovations, and of course, you should always be up to date. But if technological innovations had been the name of the game, then the fantastic Barack Obama database, voter contact base, and every money in the world available would not have resulted in Trump winning the election because of, of course, all that big technology, all that know-how was transferred to the Democrats uh, 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 and not the other side. So, so, and that's one thing. And another thing that's, I think, uh, something that liberals have to deal with is uh, the underlying notion, and that's, that's a big issue that I, that I will obviously not have time to address, and that's, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, is the discrepancy between our liberalism and our commitment to democracy. Because when I say, when I tell people, well, these people, you know, they just follow the Fidesz media, they just buy this, they jump out, and I say, well, yes, in a way, but maybe there's a reason they do that, and you know, they've been brainwashed. And when you say they've been brainwashed, you also sometimes, I think, say, uh, well, you know, if only people were smarter. Uh, and of course, all the empirical data tells us that changing how smart people are will not necessarily change their voting intentions. And that's, I think, 
I suggest this is a game I like to play. If, if, I, if I just ask them, do you, by the way, honestly believe that the best way we should choose our leaders is simply have everyone's, even the stupid ones, have one vote and the smart ones one vote? Do you agree with that notion? Because that's democracy. And very often you will say, you will hear the answer, well, in a way, or just say no, right? So there is a fundamental problem there, I think, uh, that we should address. Many of us believe uh, ourselves, myself, of course, included to be smarter than theirs. So, uh, so, so I come to my three suggestions. Right? And these are three suggestions that have been written about in liberal papers. Uh, and I think all of them are ideas that are, would be worth exploring could they go out of the drawing board. Um, all of them concern Hungary, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for being too Hungary specific. Uh, what should, what sh should some of the bold ideas be that liberals uh, should be standing for, uh, that they should be introducing to, the, to, to discussion? One concerns migration, basically says, OK, so we have this big brain drain in Hungary. OK, so we have uh, a lot of young Hungarians leaving. Why don't we come the political party that, or the political movement, if you will, that simply says, OK, so we will do our own brain drain. Not, of course, from Muslim countries, and we should address that because Hungarians don't like them. But why don't we go out and say, OK, we want now half a million young people coming in from poorer countries uh, uh, across Asia and across, across South America to have them take jobs in Hungary and integrate to Hungarian society, thereby increasing the size of Hungary and creating even new Hungarians. Now, this, that idea might at first sound ridiculous even to me, but it so, shows the sort of logic that I think uh, goes behind the notion that you take one argument and you try to make that argument uh, uh, change in a way to a different idea. Uh, the second idea, it's, it's, it's a more specific idea that I've uh, actually heard discussed, and that's the, our Hungarian... Um, our Hungarian guests, I think, or Hungarian uh, members in this room are aware that the Hungarian national anthem, it's, it's really depressing. So one idea I heard was, well, why don't we suggest that we should just change the national anthem, have a big vote on what other Hungarian poem should be the national anthem? Why don't we just say what everybody believes in these circles, that it's a depressing poem? We're not disrespectful in saying that. We're just saying, why don't we find another 19th century poet who has a more uplifting uh, a poem and change that into the way that that was once called sort of a liberal nationalism saying well Hungarian history is not just about Horthy it's not just about you know being depressed it's also about Odi it's also about, it's about challenging conventions it's also about modernity it's also about those things why don't we try to introduce that and the third idea and it's not Hungary specific that's that's uh, that's actually I've heard on the European front and that concerns uh, what, what I like to call liberals should become the party of leisure what does that mean uh, you are, of course, aware of the notion that of the four-day uh, working week. Uh, and there is an argument behind saying that should be the forefront of liberal, actually, it's not just for liberals, it's for others as well, policy. And here's the argument. Anytime there's a new political innovation, we say, oh my God, machines or new innovations are making our job so much easier that certainly we will have to work less next year, right? It's been from, from the 19th century. We will now have cars and machines, we'll have to work less. Result, we work more. Uh, second half of the 20th century, the society, the consumer society, will make our lives so much easier with the computers. We will have to work less. You see, we work more. And even today, what's the, re what's the result of saying, uh, well, many things will be able to be done more easily? Oh my God, how we will find work. Instead, should the new argument say, well, that's really good because then we'll have more free time. Isn't that fundamentally what the human experience should be about? It's so great that we should aim at a society in which everyone can agree to work less and still reach uh, the same level, thus becoming the party of leisure. I believe working less would be a very, very uh, popular uh, uh, idea to say. And with that, I, 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 I close my arguments. And please bear in mind, it was drawn from practical experiences rather than my empirical uh, research and, 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 and all the things that, uh, that others will, I'm, I'm sure, uh, uh, discuss here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Me personally, I would be very much interested in the process when Hungarians would be voting about the next anthem or the li lyrics of it. Uh, so, uh, but now after this uh, little joke, let's continue with the questions. Uh, also, the members of the panel can react if they want, and uh, there's a microphone. So, if you have any questions in the rows of our audience, then then please address to uh, to Choba. And then Tomas would like May to react. May I offer react. just a word of comment? Because the, about the third proposition, it was actually proposed by Polish, the largest 
opposition parties. Mm -hmm. Donald Tusk said that he would like to introduce a four uh, day week work week uh, in time uh, after he uh, wins elections so it has been already tried and funny thing it was really not so not very well understood by his own electorate because they thought that civic platform is a rather free market kind of party and now he proposes some social security and people were people were surprised by that um, I, I, I start with Tusk. It's, um, I think very often it, this suggestion is, is picked up. So the four-day working week is, of course, uh, suggested by, by, uh, by a number of political parties and political movements. Or and what I think sh could be interesting in this is the whole notion. So, you know, becoming the party of leisure. I think that's, that's, the, that's the essence of it. And not just uh, the specifics, but of, uh, 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 just because um, some of our Polish friends are probably uh, in, in the same thought uh, 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 around Tusk. And of course, and I think that gives me a, a, a second sort of confirmation, using the confirmation bias we all have uh, in the question, uh, which is that, you know, innovation, it, it takes time, right? Many of the things we suggest at first uh, are seen as ridiculous. The first, Barack Obama first said that the Iraq war doesn't make any sense, and he was one of a hundred. Uh, and that's basically what he came back to after eight years uh, uh, to, win the, to win the election. And, and the third exciting thing is the, the notion that we take it for granted, um, uh, and that, by the way, happened in Momento as well. That free market is somehow aimed at not having free time, right? It's 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 that it's against this notion, and I understand the logic behind it, but I think it's very interesting. As to the anthem issue, well, you know, we we do an alternative election, isn't that what what you, you know? Fidesz, that's exactly what Fidesz did when they were in opposition. They just had their own supporters in their own national consultation, which is of course not a national and not a consultation, but sort of a one way uh, a message directed at our own supporters, which would be a better way uh, of saying it. But that's basically what they sh said: should we do this or should we do that? It's of course not that. But of course, you know, you can vote on the internet. You can suggest your own ways, and then the next national uh, and then the next national uh, holiday, we will only talk about our own national alternative anthem and show how much better it would be. Yeah, I think th this idea shows that this is something that most of our supporters believe, isn't it? That it's you know, every time there's a a, a soccer game on, which which more of our supporters view them would naturally occurred to me, as I learned from research, uh, you hear this and, and this discussion comes in every time, right? Oh, yeah, the Hungarian anthem is just, uh, it's going to be boring. And so, so I think that the notion here is that you can address some of these things and even take the debate of being disrespectful. And of course, uh, and of course, there are issues, but I, I, I like when already we start talking about, well, okay, how, how do we choose it? Why do we choose it? Because then already you're discussing the idea. Okay, so questions from the audience, Istvan, and then, okay. Thank you. When uh, talking about political innovation, I think it's very important to bring in very new and uh, first time maybe shocking issues, uh, because culture, politics, society uh, have changed and there are many different ideas people would like to discuss, not only old-fashioned uh, maybe boring, as you said, uh, ideas. Uh, but I want to connect uh, this to the political party system level, what you avoided, and it's not necessary. But yesterday we had a, another debate with Hungarian experts, and uh, one issue was that actually Hungarian opposition parties are relatively unpopular. And there might be a change because of the lack of any sort of political innovation f within the opposition landscape, which means that some relatively new parties, one of them is a very extremist right-wing party, uh, our, our nation, and the other party, which is also well-known, the Two-Tailed Dog Party, which started as a fun party, these two might uh, have an advantage because of the uh, inability of the relatively old opposition parties to renew themselves, which might create a totally new situation uh, at, on the side of the opposition when these two parties will become, would become stronger. And it might create an even more chaotic situation from my perspective. Well, uh, our nation 
party is certainly an extremist or most fascist party. The two dogs party might not be taken very seriously and we don't know about their ideas and programs. So what will happen if there is no political innovation on the opposition side? Would it mean a collapse, even worse situation uh, in the long run? Or in the short run? Yeah, predictions are always difficult, especially when uh, they're about the future. Uh, but um, I, don't I don't think all nation is an innovative party. It's a classic right-wing party, right? It's, they're doing the same thing as Jobbik did. Jobbik, when they, they came uh, first in the Hungarian scene, they basically looked at the data. Oh my god, 80% of the Hungarian population has very bad ideas about the Roma population. 50% of the population says we should physically uh, exclude Roma from people of non-Roma, 50%, and they said, so why don't we address this issue and become so popular? Uh, I'm not saying it's the same with, with all nations, but basically they're, they're tapping into that. In Hungary, 13% of the people believe that the borders of Trianon should be changed by force. 13%, it's basically, we have this right-wing uh, uh, electorate in Hungary, it, it changes of course, but I think they're going to that. And of course, the, the two-tailed bug party, it's, it's innovative in a way that they say politics should be a joke, but I, I always uh, invite you to look at debates with the two-tailed dog party. It's very difficult to keep up joking about things, even for me. Uh, uh, <laughs> you see, you're not laughing anymore uh, 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 after a while. So, so I, it's difficult for them. But I mean, to, to defend the opposition in a way, there is such a thing as following your own rational logic. Of course, we know this. Following your own national logic, your own rational logic, your rational logic as a politician is that you want to get into parliament, which is more likely to happen that you somehow uh, kill the idea that would make it innovative because that that might actually result in your party being less popular or just sticking to it. And even if your party size decrease, go ahead in your own party and becoming a politician. And the same logic goes on and on and on. Of course, we know this. That's why Fidesz works on it. Uh, it, 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 by game theory, you can you can there are easy models to show this because for for an opposition party to be really innovative, it would mean first of all having strong leadership enough that it's not immediately killed inside. Second of all, having the time, the resources, uh, uh, and sort of the the, the the strength already to be able to go against the first criticism, which always comes. The biggest problems very often, not just in Hungarian opposition, is that for politics to be successful, it takes a very long time. I mean, Fidesz has been talking about uh, not letting migrants into the country for how long? For six years, seven years, a, long, a very long time. Uh, and, and you know, it, it, even they do that. The Hungarian opposition campaign changed its posters every two weeks. Maybe we had better reach than Fidesz did. That's why we didn't have to uh, to keep them up for six years. Uh, so, so that's 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 that that would be my answer to that. And 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 I think there was one more question, and I I, I will was there okay. So 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 I'm uh, 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 again. I, I I will have to leave. And, and and of course, if I had more time, I would have said all the disclaimers. Right as I said, food for thought. Right. Do not take this more seriously and do not think uh, us working in politics stupid. I just wanted to raise some of these issues that they might be maybe informative for your discussion or maybe give you another aspect, another edge. I, one of the most important things I, 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 I always believe is that no one knows the correct answer, right? The correct answer as liberals should, should come out of these discussions. And I am sure that one answer might work in one circumstance and another might not work in some other circumstance. We should always bear that in mind. And if I had to be you know, more provocative in some of these, that's easy for me because I will now be able to leave and have you criticize these without me. And with that, thank you so much for, for, for this invitation and thank you all. So much. And uh, after this presentation, which was rather focused on Hungary, we will, uh, we'll a bit, we will have a little bit broader perspective because we will have uh, some in-depth analysis from the region. Uh, and um, just a very short comment before that when we are in a problematic situation, when we have a problem, when we are in a trouble, then sometimes we are used to think that we are the only ones in, with these problems, we are the only one in this uh, troubleful situation, and, uh, and sometimes we cannot see the, 
the worst examples and the solutions. Uh, after these uh, three presentations, we will see whether our speakers are rather optimistic or pessimistic from the, from the region. Uh, so let's start with Roman Jakic, who is a former uh, Minister of Defense from Slovenia, former member of the Slovenian Parliament and a member of the European Parliament, currently the president of the Lipsin um, um, coalition organization, let's say, and he will be talking about the liberal reactions on, to nationalism uh, in the Balkan region. So, Roman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if I will be so innov innovative, energetic as uh, Mr. Thoth was uh, here, but uh, greetings to all of you and uh, thanks to my long-standing friend Istvan uh, Hegedush and the Hungarian uh, European Institute for inviting me uh, to this conference, it, it is my great uh, pleasure and honor to be with you today. As the leader of Lipsen, which is the liberal southeast uh, European network on which the, also the Hungarian Europe Institute is uh, also the member, my task today uh, is to say something about the nationalisms uh, in the Western Balkans and to describe liberal ways of uh, fighting against them. My intention is not to let's say, uh, uh, to outline nationalism in the region historically, because I think you are all uh, familiar with this. My purpose is to somehow to present uh, to you possible scenarios of developments uh, of um, so-called great nationalism, which is or are already uh, partly realized in the Western Balkans. As, as you know, the Western uh, Balkan is powder keg uh, that can explode at uh, any moment. The war in the 90s in the former Yugoslavia remind us uh, uh, what's the effect, effect of this kind of uh, explosion. More than one, uh, 140,000 people died and 3.8 million people were displaced. And the reason for this unfortunate and sad uh, human numbers was the great uh, nationalisms in, 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 in the former Yugoslavia. And in the last uh, few years, uh, the tendency of uh, great nationalisms have uh, re-emerged again in the region, unfortunately. Uh, the tendencies of establishing large uh, mono-ethnical uh, states like, uh, like uh, Great Serbia, or as they are calling now the uh, the Serbian world, which, so which is Serbia plus Republic of Srpska in Bosnia and Herzegovina plus Montenegro plus not part of Kosovo and some parts of Croatia. Then we have the tendency of uh, Great Albania, so Albania plus Kosovo plus north, the west part of North Macedonia, and then Greater Croatia. Don't forget also this: the Croatians plus the plus the the, the Herzegovina and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And also the recently expanded Bulgaria with the, with the part of the uh, North Macedonia. But the least, but not uh, um, last, but not least, also the Great Hungary. By the way, you know, the, as we can see, some tendency to desire to annul uh, the Trianon Peace Treaty and get back to what uh, Hungary uh, lost uh, when treaty was con conducted in 1920, uh, uh, and where Hungary lost more than two thirds of the territories. And at the same time, it is um, absolutely uh, clear that if the borders in the Balkans begin uh, to change each of the, uh, of the before mentioned great nationalism will gain their own momentum, unfortunately. If this happens, this unfortunate domino effect will, uh, that's my prediction, will, uh, will begin with the main player in the West Balkan Serbia, which is the, the, the most further on or developed in, 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 in that uh, direction. Uh, and uh, in this uh, nationalist uh, search, Macedonians, uh, Bosniaks and uh, Montenegrins will uh, draw the shortest straw for, for sure. Uh, and I must remind you uh, that every border change in the Balkan in the history of this region has uh, not brought anything good. It, 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 most of the time it's brought war. Uh, and paradox is that some EU countries and USA are helping Serbian uh, great nationalism in, uh, in this intention. By the way, um, their goal is good one because they want to somehow politically and economically 
separate Serbia from, from other Russia. That is why they are ready to turn a blind eye and give, it, uh, give in to Serbian's uh, regional ambitions. But this is in the geopolitical context, the game of the uh, big players to draw so-called red line between the Russia and Europe. And I must say that when Obama and Putin discussed this uh, uh, in front of us at the NATO summit in Wales, it was clearly uh, to put it that the Russian red line that divides Russia and Europe does not end on the borders of the former Soviet Union, uh, but runs through the Serbia um, and the Republic, uh, Republic of Srpska all the way to Montenegro. And as the former defense minister, uh, who strongly lobbied for Montenegro's uh, uh, membership in NATO. I saw with my own eyes how Russia offered Montenegro first one billion and then two billion uh, dollars to let it have a military navy based a base in uh, Bar in the Montenegrin part of the Adriatic Sea. So if we prevent it, uh, them for doing uh, so in 2015, through the 2020 parliamentarian election and the last presidential election on the 2nd of, of April, they managed to do it uh, this, um, uh, this year. Probably in this tense situation in, of the war in Ukraine, um, the vast majority of the, of the people did not notice, unfortunately, uh, the Russian process of uh, denazification of Montenegro. Uh, and that denazification of the Montenegro has, has definitely become. All this through the Serbian Orthodox Church and the Russian politi uh, political proxies who played a decisive role in, in, in this process, uh, which started, as I said, 2020 elections, when uh, pro-Moscow politicians uh, came to the power and succeeded in complete uh, changing the country political course from, from pro Euro, Euro Atlantic country to the pro Russian one, uh, uncompromising from interfering with the justice, um, uh, taking over all the media, preventing the operation of the uh, civil society or non governmental organization, and uh, completely suspend uh, of the negotiation for Montenegro's EU membership. And on April the 2nd, so recently, the last institution that uh, defended this Euro uh, Atlantic Montenegro fell, uh, uh, institution of the president of the state, which was the last uh, stone uh, uh, on the way of the, of the Russian influence. So Russia misusing the national narrative because it was all this was done through the, through the national uh, narrative will do everything to preserve this, uh, its influence in the Western Balkan. They are ready to uh, do anything for this uh, purpose. For example, the statement of the Russian ultranationalist Alexander Dugin that uh, Russia in the Balkans should complete what it started should be uh, should be uh, taken seriously. I will just quote him. He said, the return of Serbia to the Russian geopolitical agenda of Slavic revival will come again. You will see when we formulate the goals for the Balkans, now we need to finish what we started. So that, that the Balkan is one of the most important sphere of Russia geopolitical interest does not need to be en en emphasized. Uh, uh, but uh, when those words come from the mouth of Alexander Dugin, who is called uh, Putin's brain, who told the British BBC News in the summer of 2014 uh, that war between Russia and Ukraine is uh, inevitable uh, and called uh, on uh, Russian uh, President Putin to save the moral authority of the state by uh, military intervention in Ukraine, and then the tone of the, such a statement definitely is more than than worrying so um the question is what uh, we liberals are supposed to do when uh, populist illiberal politicians have already uh, uh gas at political power uh, it is the challenging uh, but uh, uh maybe maybe some solutions are on the table or we can we can follow it it is essential to to educate uh, the public on the potential dangers of the nationalism populism. Uh, we need to defend institutions such as the ju judiciary, the media and the civil society, which play a critical role uh, in maintaining democratic values. Uh, 
if you look uh, all the author authoritarians and the nationalists uh, in Europe from, if you want, Orban, Vucic, uh, Janez Jansha in my country, uh, Kaczynski, Savinsky, uh, Salvini, sorry, uh, uh, Le Pen, uh, etc. Uh, you will see that they immediately started uh, 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 destroying exactly uh, these three areas. In Poland, uh, the primary judiciary. In Hungary, the civil sphere labeled as uh, Soros puppets. In Slovenia, direct attack uh, uh, on the media by replacing all the directors and the editor in chief of the public media, etc. And uh, uh, if, uh, as if they are all using the, uh, the rule book uh, uh, written by Bannon. So I think they are all uh, uh, learning this in the small uh, Hyacenda in Italy where Bannon is organizing the education for those guys. Um, then it's the building coalition with other political parties, uh, civil society and organization. Uh, also, the international support is very uh, uh, important. The national part, the partners such as EU, the US uh, and other democratic countries can provide diplomatic support uh, of the system and engaging in the peaceful protest. A uh, peaceful, non-violent protest can help to raise awareness of issues and pressure uh, uh, populist politicians to respect democratic norm. And I will give you the example of the Slovenia when Janez Janša came to the power in Slovenia and started with his illiberal governance uh, 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 methods. Um, a civil society organized itself and for two and a half years and maybe that's the in, in, innovation uh, we are talking until the fall of the far right uh, regime uh, gathered every friday every single friday for a protest and then yansha uh, under the pretext of covid banned gathering for health reasons and demand this this safe distance between the people uh, demo demonstrators uh, uh, came to the protest on bicycles uh, every Friday, so regardless of uh, holidays, weather, or police brutality, they cycled and uh, and mass around the parliament and the government. And uh, the funny things in all of this and uh, uh, in overthrowing of the authoritarian regime, one of the major roles play played by the tiny Eighth of March Institute. I was telling you yesterday about it a non-governmental organization founded by seven, eight uh, girls aged between 20 and 30 years who defeated Yansha in the free referendums, you know, really good organized referendums. They have been one of the, indeed, the most active civil society voices against the described negative tendency of the government, uh, organizing, as I said, uh, the protest uh, petitions, humanitarian action, and formulating uh, also legislative proposal and uh, demands. By the way, uh, just to add, uh, the opposition did not participate uh, in this orga uh, in, in the organization of this Friday cycling. Uh, even more, we did not participate uh, in protests uh, 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 at all. Uh, we came in front of the parliament only when the organizers of the protests uh, called us, and I think it was three or four times uh, in those two and a half, uh, two and a half year. Uh, but, you know, there is no one size fits all solution to addressing the rise of populist liberal politicians. So it is the difference. And also in the Western Balkan, uh, um, you will find, uh, uh, you will find uh, different approaches, but it is essential to work together to find the best strat strategies for, for, for this. Uh, what uh, we find in our work in the Southeast uh, European region is also the fact that, unfortunately, um, uh, Madame Ramona was talking about the EU, but unfortunately, non-EU member states uh, cannot expect the same procedure and pressure of the European institutions uh, uh, in case uh, a state starts to move uh, slippy slope towards the, the building uh, uh, illiberal, semi-authoritarian political regime. Uh, all the institutions, so, oh, sorry, so Parliament, uh, Council, uh, and the Commission do not have the same responsibility uh, 
to monitor closely and respond uh, to the threats of democratic values and the rule of law in non-EU uh, member states as they can do it uh, with the EU member states. And the, the, the example is the case of Hungary where the European Union launched uh, uh, infringement procedures, activated Article 7. And uh, the only serious pressure uh, um, that EU institution can uh, exert on both EU members and non-EU members is uh, withholding the EU funds. And I think that uh, in, in a way uh, with this uh, EU Commission forced Belgrade um, uh, to make a concession in negotiation uh, with Kosovo. Uh, so I will, uh, I will um, conclude saying that um, one of the most important segments uh, of the uh, fight against the authoritarian regime is the issue of the media freedom. Uh, in the invitation for today's uh, event is an important question which says how to react to the overwhelming state propaganda of the ruling party that regularly creates new external and internal enemies of the people rising fear in the society. And from my experience uh, of the Janša rules in Slovenia and from experience in the Balkans, this can be complex and challenging task indeed, uh, but some potential strategy could be considered. So counter propaganda, uh, which should be, uh, should be practiced. Uh, this could involve the creation of the alternative media channels that provide more balanced and accurate information. Uh, then supporting independent media. Uh, independent media outlets can help to expose corruption and abuse of power by liberal leaders. Uh, so supporting them, not just financially, but also through promoting their work can help. Fact checking, this is very, also very important. This was done in, in Slovenia and we practice this in some countries in the Western Balkan where uh, uh, fact uh, checking organization can help to expose false uh, claims and uh, misinformation spread by the ruling party and promote accurate uh, information. It was said by Peter today, this morning, he was talking about this. Then is the civil society mobilization. I was talked about this. Uh, so human rights groups, labor unions, student groups uh, can play a critical role in mobilizing citizens to resist state propaganda. And then it comes to international solidarity, education, and then straightening uh, democratic institution. That is very important. I was saying yesterday that in Slovenia, uh, Janez Janša did not manage because the institution were too strong even for him, having, you know, uh, doing everything uh, uh, negative to, to the institution for three years because the institution the ref institutions refused them. So uh, strengthening democratic institutions such as independent judiciary, uh, imp impartial electoral commission and the free press can help to prevent the consolidation of the power by. Uh, but, and I will finish, but certainly all this, uh, all this struggle against the nationalists, uh, populists, and uh, uh, authoritarians uh, depends on ourselves. Uh, as, and I will uh, finish with the quoting the Barack Obama, who say, um, change will not come if we wait for some other persons or some other time. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the cha change that we seek. So I will stop with this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think we will elaborate some of your thoughts uh, later during the Q&A. Now let's continue with the Czech example. As uh, Istvan mentioned yesterday, we had a conversation with some Hungarian intellectuals. And one of the most important questions was the possible ways of cooperation between the civil society organizations and the political parties. And uh, I think um, uh, our next speaker, Mikula Mina, will add some, uh, some new thoughts um, to this uh, conversation with the, with the Czech example. Uh, his presentation entitled the Czech example civil society and parties against populist so the floor is yours and uh, as you can see it's with a PowerPoint presentation 
Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would uh, try, yeah, but please, uh, this, this doesn't work. Okay, it works. I'll try to be different. I will tell you a story. Um, I wasn't interested in politics. And I had no idea how it worked. I have never been to a demonstration in my life. And I wasn't sure if an individual could make a difference. Uh, yet, by coincidence, uh, two years later, I was standing on a stage in front of 300,000 people uh, as a leader of biggest civic movement in Czech Republic since 1989. Another year later, I was founding new political party. I was 24 when it started. Uh, and in first case, we were very successful. In second, we were unsuccessful. But in both cases, it was a great experience. So let me tell you the story of last six years in Czech Republic, uh, as, as I personally had experienced them. Are you ready? <laughs> OK, so here we go. Uh, long time ago or not so long time ago things were getting worse across whole the world and especially in central europe populists and extremists were gaining more and more power and democracy was in danger putin trump erdogan orban kaczynski fitzo babish zeman they they were everywhere and uh but i didn't care <laughs> Uh, I was typical student of philosophy and theology. Uh, this <laughs> this uh, was my look like, and I wore terrible sweaters, orange be orange bell bottom uh, <clears throat> pants. I read and wrote uh, poetry, and I admired Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin, Hendrix, Pink Floyd, and so. And I was trying to understand Plato and Heidegger because I studied philosophy. I was newly married and expecting a uh, calm and quiet honeymoon year. Everything was going well, until third man came to our marriage, Andrei Babish. Uh, uh, just for case you don't know him, uh, who, is, who is Andrei Babish? It's the second richest man in Czech Republic, oligarch, with very strange origin of property. Also, he bought biggest media house in Czech Republic. He was criminally prosecuted because of subsidy fraud. He is former agent of communist police. He's a liar. <laughs> and he's also owner of a political party. So very big conflict of interest. And uh, what happened uh, that I uh, suddenly became from passivist activist? Uh, it happened that, uh, that like millions of other people in Czech Republic, before the election, I received to my mailbox his paper, and it was it was letter, and it was called contract. Yeah, this is the this is the copy of the letter, and it was called contract of Andrei Babish of and citizens of Czech Republic. And there were twenty two promises before elections. What would he do? And one of them that uh, shocked me <laughs> was I promised to support and cultivate democracy in Czech Republic, and I was shocked because he was so cheeky. Yeah, at first time I laughed at it, but then I, I got anger and I said, well, how can you, how, how dare you? And uh, then he uh, won the elections and uh, very, very strongly, very overwhelmingly. He and uh, communists and right-wing extremists got uh, 115 of 200 seats. So very big majority, nearly constitutional majority. So it was clear that it's really big danger for democracy and we are in crisis. And uh, next four years will, will show if the, this trend will continue, we, we could follow the Hungary way. And this, uh, this shocked me and I said to myself, maybe I have to do something about it. So what, what can I do? And I remember this, con this contract before elections, these 22 promises, and there, was, there were small uh, sentence, he asked the citizens, please give me one moment of your time. 
And I said to myself, okay, maybe a million times, a uh, million moments. So, and this, this is how started million moments for democracy. Uh, with motto, we unite people who care about democracy. Because the key idea of this movement is very simple. If democracy is under threat, perhaps we don't need big heroes who will sacrifice everything about, about it and leave their uh, job and, you know. Rather, we need a million people who will do a little something for it on a regular basis. We'll find a moment and do something small. Because these people are, are already there. The society is full of these people who know there is a problem. They are afraid of populists and they are just complaining to their friends. All you need to do is just unite these people in one concentrated effort that will make a difference. So we said, okay, Mr. Babish, we will take your word seriously. Let's fulfill your promise and we will control you. I don't know if you know uh, chart, uh, chart 77, but it's the same principle. We will control you and we will just uh, want that you fulfill your words. And we made public petition. Uh, we met personally to him and made uh, a selfie, gave him the petition. And uh, uh, this is how it, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of your life some, somehow. And this is how it started. And what, what followed? Uh, he had a uh, very strong ally, Mr. Miller Zeman, our president, who, who was re-elected in 2018. And uh, suddenly it was clear that these promises were just a piece of paper. It was just marketing. So we, uh, we, go, we went uh, to, to more push and we said, no, we will not pretend that this is normal to have such a prime minister and we want him to resign and we will collect one million signatures for in 100 days for this, uh, for this purpose. And we were surprised that uh, it worked because in the first 20 days, 200,000 people signed this. Uh, in the next, next year's uh, totally 440,000, which is 4% of Czech, Czech nation. So in, in one night, we became most influential uh, civic movement uh, in Czech Republic, and it didn't last 100 days. In fact, it was, 300, uh, 1300 days until he uh, resigned. Uh, but uh, this is how it started. There was first, first demon demonstration, it was total punk. I didn't know how to do it. So I was standing on very small table, one to one meter uh, in between 10,000 and 20,000 people. And I had no uh, speech because we didn't f thought that it will be necessary. We just thought, oh, okay, we will gather the people and sign the petition. So I, I, have to, I had to improvise for, for 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, so so the, the beginnings were tough, but it, get, it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, we were organizing just uh, using the Facebook and Google Sheets. We were a few, few students and uh, it worked. Uh, maybe this is very interesting uh, aspect of, of this success, uh, the technology of organizing, but I have no time to speak here about it more. Uh, but it was not just Prague. Uh, we managed to have uh, local, local uh, coordinators in more than 100, uh, 100 places. Uh, and after each uh, protest, we, they, they just made photo and send, send it to us. So it was, now it was, I was shocked and it was clear that, wow, this is really movement. This is movement for democracy. And uh, it was big success, but uh, Babish's government got uh, confidence. We said that it's a government of one, one man, uh, as is shown in this photo. And uh, we, were <laughs> we were asking what to do next, if uh, should we continue with this activity because it wasn't planned, uh, or we should become a political party, which I was afraid of, or we should professionalize as a civic movement. And, and we uh, tried the third way. We did many, many uh, events. Uh, it was quite uh, powerful. All, all the world media were full of, of these photos. And uh, the, uh, the tipping point was 2019, where the police, uh, one day, the police said Andrei Babi should go to the court. Next day, one day later, he replaced Minister of Justice. And new minister was his uh, friend, and friend of his and friend of uh, President Zeman. And it was, uh, this is, it was Maria Beneshova, and it was just tipping point. Uh, we said, are you kidding? 
This is, uh, this is the biggest attack on justice since, uh, and democracy since 1999. And we know that its aim was to replace the supreme and chief prosecutors and to make such a called judiciary reform. And we said just no. Uh, I stopped my studies and devoted myself to defending democracy full time. Uh, and we said we will protest week to week, which was a risk because not often it is successful, but this time it was. This is first week, second week, third week, fourth week, bigger square. It's, it's the one of the biggest squares in Czech Republic, Wenceslas Square. It was half fulfilled. Uh, celebrities and actors and famous people came came and joined the, the movement. Uh, two, uh, two, two weeks later, it was overcrowded, and nearly 20 or 30,000 people uh, have, haven't found a place. So we said, OK, there is only one bigger place in Czech Republic where could we gather. Uh, and uh, yeah, and there were 300, more than 300 local protests in regions. Uh, each week we were, uh, one week we were in Prague, and second week we were in regions. And uh, here you can see the photos. And in the end, we met on the Letna Plain, which is the biggest public place. And it was quite epic. And I think it was really a hopeful moment for all these people, because suddenly they saw that they are not alone. That the country is full of people who seems it in the same way, and that we are really strong power, and we could, uh, we could make a change. And it was a very hopeful, hopeful moment. Uh, but uh, government still didn't fall. It was backed by president. Uh, now I, I would maybe tell you about three roles we did, and today we heard uh, many many proposals what to do. The Million Moments had three roles. We basically we, we were watchdog organization, so we defended democratic institutions, but we were also gardener. Uh, we try to activize civic society. We believe that if hundreds of thousands of people are active, it will make a difference. And, and in the third place, we were medium, because I definitely agree that, that medium, uh, mediums are critical moment. If there are all medias are cr cr uh, controlled by the party, it's really bad. So, but, but we became medium. We had million, million reach, reach, yeah. So, and through this medium, you can educate and, and <clears throat> share awareness. And all you need to do is just widen the circles. Widen the circles and more and more people involved in this movement. Uh, this was the strategy. We did it again, uh, one half year later, after, 30 years after World War Revolution, the people came again. Uh, from one day to another, it was clear that it that was no coincidence that these people are just here. And this time we focused not only to criticize Babish, uh, but we were asking for positive alternative. And we made a call to opposition where we said to them, to opposition parties, hey, open up to new people and new voters, uh, articulate a vision for our country and cooperate in a clever way. Because there were many five, five hundred democratic uh, parties and uh, we were just articulating the demand for, for, the, for the political parties. Uh, we negotiated with them personally, uh, and it seemed that it will work, but there was big complication. In 2020, there came the coronavirus, and with, with it, ban on public gatherings, as, as we heard it before. And, but the preferences of the political parties were still the same, yeah? That was the biggest problem, that Babish had still his 30%. And so I asked, I asked, where is the plan? Where is the plan how to beat them? Uh, and I met with all the opposition uh, leaders, and I, I asked them this question. And I found a very horrible way. There was no plan. They actually didn't have a plan how to reach new voters. Yeah, there were just uh, uh, some very naive thinking that maybe it could be, be better. So, and it was really, it really shocked me because I realized that the only way to really change our elections, so political parties, and if these parties are not aware of the problem or they have no plan, what, what we will have to do? 
it was clear that we somehow need to reach 300,000 new voters. Some, some voters who don't like this current opposition or there is no other way to succeed. Uh, so I said to myself, okay, maybe I should try it because I, if nobody should try it, it will be, it will be catastrophic. Uh, I was really afraid of this movement because I was very young and, uh, but I didn't knew, know anybody else who would do it. So I would try to, to, to find very interesting personalities and, and, get, and get them to the politics. But we had this problem. There was very big risk that uh, if we will have only 4% and no, and if we didn't get to parliament, uh, we will do more harm than good. We will weaken the opposition parties, not strengthen. So we made uh, this uh, this proposal that we are collecting 500,000 signatures of people who want this new political force. We will try if there is demand for this force, and if uh, if only then we will candidate. And if not, uh, we will not candidate either properly or, or not at all. It was our motto. We uh, started uh, this movement, and uh, it was very big back, backfire then. All the opposition parties just started to attacking us and all, all the press and media houses uh, because they were connected with the parties. And uh, our biggest weapon, which should have, should have to be a contact campaign, was not possible <laughs> due to lockdowns. Uh, so we were trying hard but we failed we co collected only 40,000 uh, signatures and yeah we realized that there is no demand for our supply because of many reasons timing was horrible our mistakes my mistakes too little time not enough sources attacks of our opponents etc uh, but in the end it showed that it will be very risky to for democracy to continue with this party so because we could damage other democratic parties so we said okay we will keep our own promise we withdraw it from election. We supported opposition parties. Uh, the the party uh, ended uh, in the March. Uh, it was uh, really tough for me. <laughs> it hurt it a lot, uh, but there were positive uh, signs. Uh, first, the Milan Moments for Democracy movement continued after me and were doing a really great job, which was I was really glad that it that it was success. Second, the politicians were pushed by the people to make two coalitions. First was uh, right uh, conservative one, Spolu, of three parties, and second was uh, central liberal uh, Starost, Starostové a Piráti. And there were next parliament election in October. One week before them, it seemed that it's nearly impossible to beat Babish. Uh, the, the polls showed that he very, very probably would be ruling again with some, some allies. Uh, and only miracle could, uh, could change it. And this miracle happened. Uh, this miracle really uh, do happened because you see, you see the results uh, ANO, uh, party of Mr. Babish, was closely second. What was more important, three, his, three of his allies was just closely under the line, under the 5% line. So he lost his allies. But what was the biggest, the, the most important, was that there were three, more than 300,000 new voters for democratic parties. Nobody was uh, thinking about this possibility, but somehow uh, 320,000 uh, voters came. And this was the game changer. This is like a uh, whole, this, if you would like to imagine 300,000, it's, it's something like that. And this changed all the situation. Also, so we had now, we had new government, which is definitely not perfect, doing many mistakes, but it's, definitely much better than these populists because they are not destroying democracy. They are also supporting Ukraine. Uh, what is maybe more important is that we have also a new president. Uh, he is quite good. I think maybe he is very, very good case study of political personality who can beat populists uh, with uh, telling truth, unpopular truth in calm way. 
uh, he has some very good inner strength, and also he has he is very <laughs> sexy looking. Maybe it's uh, <laughs> the most uh, important. And uh, I will end with few lessons learned from this story. I told you. Uh, so here, maybe I will be more precise in the paper, following the paper, but here are 17 short lessons. First is that idea of million moments really works. There are many people who care, just unite them. Make it easy to join and satisfying for people. Use the win-win synergy and give, give them both great ideals, but also small and very concrete steps to do. What they can do, what, can, what they can do. Uh, tell people that every of every moment matters, and you must highlight that they are doing this moment for democracy not because of results, but because of themselves. It's a matter of identity. They would be better people, because then they have very strong inner motivation, uh, which will uh, be be long term. Make everything possible so that everybody knows problematic facta about populists. It's very necessary because people, if people don't know the problems. Uh, they just think they are okay. Uh, truth without reach is mute. So you definitely must uh, follow the facta and follow the truth. But also you must use the power of social nets, of influencers, you must get attention. Study marketing and storytelling. Because maybe the, the, for me, the populism is really powerful technology how to get attention, how to hack brain, of how to hack human psychology. The po and populists are, are master of this. So, so you must know uh, these weapons. Uh, make truth and love cool again. Use positive emotions, great photos and symbols. You must be able to explain rule of law for Instagram. Yeah? Uh, the biggest power, I think, is to, f f to be able to formulate strong demand. If you formulate strong demand for, op for opposition parties or for people, then supply will come. Uh, if there is existential danger for democracy, egoism must go away. I, either in civil society, but also uh, among uh, political parties. They just must uh, make coalitions. And if, but if there is strong demand, they, they are pushed to do so. Because if they don't do, they, they don't do uh, voters will find someone else. Uh, definitely build strong institutions and prepare them for bad times. Uh, we, we were very, very lucky that we have very good constitution. We have uh, the Senate. And I said to you that it was very, we were very lucky that Babish have not constitution majority. But either if he did, he will now have power to rewrite the rules, to change electoral laws uh, and change uh, constitution, because we have the second chamber. So it's very necessary to have uh, good inst institutions. Uh, very probably, populists will try get all power full control of judiciary and media. So be hypersensitive uh, in cases of attacks to them. Uh, then personality of presidential candidate really matters. And also, great marketing and communication also really matters. These two components must uh, be there. One of the main reasons why our populists so strong is the weakness of Democrats. It was uh, told it here before, but yeah, it's really definitely a very strong truth. I think that you cannot beat populists by bigger populism, uh, because they will also promise more than you they doesn't need to to follow facta but czech president petr Pavel showed that by truth by competency competence is very important by some inner strength by many sacrifices and great communication you can and uh, last but not least uh, of lessons uh, is uh, never underestimate naive students in terrible sweaters thank you <laughs>I have to tell you that just like two weeks ago, I was participating at a storytelling workshop, how to do it professionally. And I think you should be the present <laughs> at these workshops because it was really amazing. So thank you so much. Uh,
Uh, and uh, now let's continue with with Poland, uh, because as you as you all know, the first uh, warning signs regarding illiberalism arrived from Hungary and Poland. And during the last couple of uh, of years, uh, during our events, workshops, and conferences organized by the Hungarian Europe Society, many times we try to understand the similarities and the differences between these two member states and the illiberalism in Hungary and Poland. So uh, now new thoughts will be added uh, to this thinking by Tomas Savchuk, who is the head of the political department of, at the Cultura Liberarna from Warsaw. And the, the title of his presentation is Responses to Illiberalism, Lessons from Poland. So the floor is yours. Thank you. So after your wonderful story, I, I worry that my presentation will be dry as hell. Uh, but at least I will not be speaking about theory so much, but about practice. So maybe that's uh, that's good. Um, OK, so I, I have three points. Uh, the first point would be uh, about uh, law and justice. Abbre the abbreviation of law and justice is peace in Polish. So I, whenever I talk about peace, that's the name of the party, law and justice. Uh, so first point will be peace and illiberalism. Second point will be the situation and strategies of the opposition. And then third point, some closing remarks. So just to establish the baseline, uh, I will uh, shortly describe what peace has done since they came to power in 2015. Uh, especially important matters happened within the judiciary and the rule of law. So uh, constitutional tribunal, since 2015, peace has appointed a majority of judges at the beginning of their term. Some of them have been appointed illegally. And uh, currently the tribunal almost does not issue rulings. In fact, if it does, they are in accordance with the wishes of the government, but it is currently completely paralyzed because the new judges wouldn't agree who should be the legal president of the institution, and some of them refused to participate in proceedings until the issue is resolved. So the tribunal has now for some time been unable even to meet a quorum. When the Supreme Court in 2017, there was an attempt at total overhaul of the court. Uh, Peace wanted to retire all the former judges. Uh, then President Duda, who was also a peace candidate for the president, vetoed the bill, but uh, changes uh, were implemented, not, not so radical changes, but changes were implemented anyway, and currently uh, around half of the judges, a little more than half of the judges, are newly appointed. The court is divided, but the president of the court is pro-government. Then there's National Council of the Judiciary, uh, which appoints and promotes judges, and there's been a total overhaul there. All new members uh, chosen by the politicians based on an unco unconstitutional bill. And then there's the disciplinary system for the judiciary, and it, this is dependent on the Minister of Justice, who is the leader of the coalition party Solidarna Polska. His name is Zbigniew Zobro. And in practice, the system works to limit the independence of the judges. Uh, then in the area of the state, there is almost no independent institutional control of the government, severely weakened checks and balances. Uh, peace has politicized civil service and prosecutor's office, as Zbigniew Zobro, the Minister of Justice, is also the uh, main prosecutor. Uh, there are procedural breaches during parliamentary proceedings on a regular basis. State institutions are openly used, state funds are openly used for party purposes. Uh, there are millions of euros of public funds transferred to people and institutions affiliated with the ruling party. And actually new information of that is revealed almost every week. In a recent scandal, NGOs related to the party, to the ruling party received money to buy expensive real estate or mansions in Warsaw. Um, also the state media broadcast the ruling party's propaganda in the most recent scandal. Uh, a journalist from a public radio service has disclosed information which allowed to de-anonymize a teenager son of an opposition MP, and the child was a victim of uh, sexual abuse and sub subsequently committed suicide a few weeks after he's been outed by the public media. So this was a large scandal uh, it just w within the last month. Among some other matters, uh, because of the violations of the rule of law, the EU has suspended, as you well know, the money for a post-COVID recovery fund for Poland as was also the case for Hungary, I believe. Other European funds could also be suspended. And at this point, uh, elections in Poland should be viewed as free, but not fair. Uh, there's been, of course, rising nationalism and anti-pluralism as 
people opposed to the government are depicted as either acting for secret private reasons or as agent, agents of foreign powers. So some general remarks about the system of government. It is important to note that peace has never had the constitutional majority, so they were not able to change the constitution. Uh, nonetheless, their mode of government could be mostly described in terms of two tendencies. First, the concentration of power, and second, the radicalization of political conflict. Generally, it works like Jarosław Kaczyński, the, the leader of the ruling Law and Justice Party, stokes some kind of fear in society, depending on the occasion of refugees or LGBT people. Most recently, peace claimed that the EU will force Poles to eat insects instead of traditional meat. And then he draws some grand political division in which he depicts the opposition as untrustworthy, the sources of insecurity, so that he can then present himself as a bedrock of security in times of conflict. So maybe a, a short note about Kaczynski's political philosophy as such. Um, he once said in an interview for a German newspaper that among all the philosophers, the ones who inspired him most were Niccolo Machiavelli and Carl Schmitt. At another time, in the 90s actually, explaining his political philosophy, he would, he would point to, and this is a quote, empiricism and by extension pragmatism, that is the rejection of excessive a priori thesis. So um, although peace has a reputation for being a traditionalist and conservative party, I think it seems important to note that they are in fact modern through and through, and uh, in some aspects postmodern, if you will. And Kaczynski has been successful precisely because he built the most ideologically flexible party in the history of in the contemporary Polish history. So now uh, we have elections coming in the in the autumn 2023. So what's uh, the main message that peace wants to sell so far? They try to to present the main theme of the campaign to be protection of the people versus neoliberal ne neoliberalism. And uh, so Prime Minister Morawiecki would usually say that before 2015, during the financial crisis and also during the economic transition in the 90s, people were left alone to themselves and left in poverty. And contrary to this, after 2015, people are protected when there is a crisis. This refers to social policies of the government, especially the 500 plus family benefit of, of 500 lotus for every child, but also 13th and 14th additional pensions for the elderly introduced by the current government. And the government frequently announces uh, subsequent uh, so-called shields, as in they announced financial COVID shields during the pandemic to protect jobs. And now there are anti-inflation shields. They are designed to ease the burden uh, of the current economic turmoil, for example, by lowering prices of electricity and gas. And then, on the other hand, peace wants to depict the opposition as heartless, antisocial, and elitist, so that they could defend the people from the elites. So now, about the opposition, second point. Um, so there have been a few most popular types of questions for the opposition after 2015. And here, as much as describing them, I, I, I generally refer the main topics of the Polish uh, political debate after 2015. So first, should first question the most, possibly the most uh, popular one after 2015, should there be one united opposition or many opposition parties? So this is a similar question as in, as in many um, countries of a region. And in fact, uh, this was the only significant question asked in the years 2015 to 2022. Uh, it was whether the opposition should unite. And the largest opposition party, Civic Platform, uh, which is now led by Donald Tusk, which, but which at the time had different leaders, uh, and was in government before 2015, wanted to unite, but the other opposition parties didn't want to do this, uh, with maybe the exception of the elections to the European Parliament in 2019, where, when most of the opposition parties went together to the elections. And to this, I would say that the opposition uh, has mostly wasted the years 2015 to 2022 in a political sense. In principle, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the idea that the opposition should unite in, in a serious political situation, such as a danger for democracy and the rule of law. But there was a practical problem in that the opposition did almost nothing else politically. So such an attitude was guided by what I call the strategy of a moral opposition in contrast to a political opposition. 
And such a way of, of thinking was in Poland surely inspired by the years of communism before 1989, when the only thing that a democratic opposition could actually do was to resort to the kind of politics of a moral protest. So, but in contemporary circumstances, um, this strategy was politically catastrophic because most voters did not believe that peace uh, constitutes a grave danger to their well-being. And in effect, the opposition did not work on systematic strategy and agenda designed for political effectiveness. It was not able to produce a proper analysis of, of why it actually lost elections. It could not understand that it needed to rebuild credibility, which it had lost before 2015. And it could not see that simply defending the rule of law and the old political system would not lead to winning elections. And this strategy was changed in 2022. Uh, Donald Tusk, uh, the former civic platform prime minister has returned to Polish politics in 2021. And at first he also would say that, and this is almost a quote, I mean, very close of him saying that the opposition should not even need to have policy positions other than being anti-law and justice. Uh, and uh, in 2022, he changed his view. And after that, civic platform began to produce a more comprehensive policy agenda which now would focus on the economic needs of the voters. So uh, rule of law was no longer the only topic that the opposition would speak of. And um, in 2023, it seems that the opposition will not be united for the upcoming elections. Civic platform would still want the whole opposition to unite, but other parties do not want to do that because they are afraid that civic platform would dominate them and that they will have no more existence after this unification. So question two for the opposition was, if unifying the opposition should not be the only goal, then what should be the agenda, the political agenda of the opposition? So in 2018, I wrote a book on this particular topic. It was called New Liberalism. And in that book, I argued that Polish liberal democratic politics should advance by addressing its three greatest weaknesses before 2015. I defined those three weaknesses to be its anti-political character in that uh, the liberal side of politics always want people to some, somehow to somehow protect people from politics uh, other than producing a political narrative and agenda that would drive politics as such. And this was this void in which law and justice was able to go into and, and explore it. Then second, uh, it should abandon its ideological conservatism and the opposition uh, has done that to a large extent for the the main example is the change on uh, abortion which happened uh, last year so far the opposition had a rather conservative stance on abortion that it should be permitted only in a few selective cases but after large social protests when peace has uh, or uh, rather the constitutional tribunal has almost banned abortion in poland also, the civic platform changed their position on, and, and now they are pro-choice, so to speak, and this is a very popular position among the voters, because the liberal uh, parties in Poland were often much more conservative than the voters, than the liberal voters, and this was a problem. And, and the third uh, weakness was free market dogmatism, and this was also one of the reasons why uh, peace could win elections, was that uh, um, but the liberal parties had a hard time offering an attractive social policy that would actually make people think that the government cares for them. And this was also something that Kaczynski could exploit. So in general, peace portrayed itself as the party that represents the will of the people. And this is, of course, a cliche, but maybe needs repeating. And he exploited shortfalls in democracy to do this. And Peace also portrayed the opposition as the party of the past, of social injustice, and of the elites that benefit from people's misery. So if the opposition were to build a new stable instance of liberal democracy in Poland, they could not just work to restore the past, because it's not very fondly thought of by, by a large section of the population, but they would need to take a leap forward in order to produce a new political situation. And I will, I will return to this point at the end of my uh, presentation. And then there's question three for the opposition, the, the last question that I will speak about, is what are law and justice's possible weak spots? So here I, here I list some theories and ideas which were popular in Polish debates within the last few years. So first risk for peace was seen to be that with time people would get bored and frustrated with peace as time passes on. 
and they will demand a political change out of their own need, and then the opposition could return to power. So uh, this was really, a, I mean, I'm not mocking anyone. This was really a popular idea in Poland for a long time. So uh, then, of course, this hasn't been the case so far. The main reason is that peace is politically very active and strategic, strategically minded. It has built a stable coalition of voters, which is primarily based on people living in rural areas and older sections of the population. And they constitute together a large number of votes. So peace definitely is still, still able to win elections in 2023. Three. Second risk for peace was seen that in time people will wake up, and this was a phrase often used, that people will wake up because they will see that peace abused the constitution and there were many political scandals and corruption and so on. And many times political commentators uh, proposed that there will be some decisive political scandal that would overturn the government in the end, a kind of political explosion which would make the voters wake up. Uh, but this idea also did not play out, and I would propose the following, following rule of thumb. Uh, no amount of political scandals could overthrow the, cover, the current government. And the reason is the existing structure of the political situation, which is more fundamental to any particular political scandal, which is as long as peace is viewed as the party of the people, voters will not change their political affiliation. And since the reason for the distribution of votes, votes is mainly structural at this point, it is only the change in the structure of the political situation which could, which could produce a new game. So then third risk for peace was internal tensions and divisions. And this is actually something that political science literature tells us uh, that hybrid regimes usually fall due to internal conflicts within the power elite. Um, and in fact, in the case of Poland, for the past three years, Jarosław Kaczyński has lost a stable majority in Parliament uh, due to internal divisions. Uh, since 2019, the opposition controls the higher chamber, Senate, because the, in, in the higher chamber we have a different electoral system. and. <coughs> It allowed the opposition to uh, win majority there, but it is not um, decisive in the sense that, that, that the higher chamber cannot block anything for the long run. They can only uh, they have they can only stop legislation for 30 days, and this is what they can do. But uh, Kaczynski has also lost majority in the lower chamber. That is same, and this uh, majority is shaky after his coalition partner Porozumienie left the coalition in 2020. And after that, uh, peace resorted to political corruption to buy support of a number of MPs, and this secures majority, but the situation is not stable. And for example, the other coalition party, Solidarna Polska by Zbigniew Ziobro, refuses to support some major bills in order to build their own political position within the coalition. So because of these internal divisions, peace has been able to pass almost no major policies through parliament for the past few years. And these divisions are also significant in the context of President Andrzej Duda, who was a peace candidate, as I've mentioned, for president in 2015 and 2020, but who has bad relations with Kaczyński, and uh, at least since 2017, and they have not talked face to face for a number of years now. And there are rumors also that Duda got promised an international position by the Americans if he uphold the remains of the rule of law in Poland. And there's fourth risk for peace and this is their own unforced mistakes and in fact uh, the only serious and enduring decline of support for peace in the polls was self-inflicted it happened after the constitutional tribunal announced the decision that i've mentioned which almost bans abortion in poland upon a motion by right-wing mps including peace ones um, and this decision provoked huge social protests known as the black protest uh, another example, in 2020, Jarosław Kaczyński angered farmers as he wanted to uh, introduce a bill strengthening the protection of animal rights. And he then backed down and the bill did not pass. And in fact, popular resistance is the only case in which peace backs down. But uh, resistance as such does not always work because in some instances, peace thinks that conflict will be benef beneficial to them. So such conflict needs always to be well framed in order for peace to back down. So then some closing remarks before the elections this year. I, I have uh, just two short remarks here. Um, first is that the political polarization in Poland is real and strong in that statistically speaking, there, are, there does not exist a group of voters 
who may change political affiliation. People who voted for peace in the past and now would consider voting for the opposition or the other, or the other, or the other way around. Opposition voters who might vote for peace. And in such circumstances, the political play in both camps is to mobilize one's voters and demobilize the opponent's voters so that they would not go to elections. In any case, in the current situation, there is no chance that any side will win a constitutional majority. And second, some of the objective circumstances may favor the current government. If we live in a time uh, of many simultaneous crises, which, they, and, and which need to be dealt with, this requires an active state, which provides security against the instability. And this attitude is more natural for peace than it is for the opposition, because the opposition has legacy of ideological economic libertarianism or kind of Thatcherite conservative liberalism. And to this, one might add an interesting fact that Prime Minister Morawiecki has written an introduction to a Polish edition of Mariana Matsukato's Entrepreneurial State. So they, this active stance is not something which is uh, contingent. It is actually a thought, thought through policy. So here's a lesson for the opposition. I think that the opposition needs to show beyond all doubt that it is not at all the party of the elites and indeed it is the party of the people and in that that it will protect the whole of the population in times of crisis and for two reasons uh, because first by doing this some of the peace voters who got frust frustrated for some reason with the government could refrain from voting staying home because they would feel safe in case the opposition wins elections and second by showing a uh, decisive attitude and active uh, policies in a time of crisis, the opposition may show strength and thus incentivize its own voters to go to the polls. Uh, at the same time, there is a kind of balancing act to be done here because the opposition needs to offer social security in such a way as not to discourage those free market voters who constitute around 15% 15 of the electorate. And then, of course, if the opposition wins, if, if that happens, the situation for liberal democracy in Poland will still be difficult. Andrzej Duda will be president until 2025, and he has veto power, and peace will still have a large social support. Many of their officials may stay put in a number of institutions. So uh, there is a distinct possibility that the opposition might, in some cases, resort to paralegal means with the intention of restoring a constitutional order but this, of course, may be viewed as performative contradiction, as there is the question of to what extent one can restore the rule of law with the use of means which do not entirely look by the book. Uh, and unfortunately, it does not seem that the opposition has given much thought as to how to deal with the practicalities of such a situation, or at least any such plans were not made public. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have more or less 20 minutes for the questions for a Q&A. So my suggestion would be to collect three or maximum four questions from the audience. Uh, and I also have some, so maybe I will supplement at the end. Uh, but first I ask the members of the audience, do you have any questions? Please be relatively short and uh, you know the question ends with a question mark. Uh, so uh, if you have any question, then Fanny will help you with the mic. Hello, welcome and thank you for the presentations. Uh, my name is Sarvas Kopany and I'm from Momentu Mozgolom and I would like to ask uh, Mr. Minar or Kersh that uh, uh, you seem to have succeeded in your project and uh, is there any way to make sure that uh, that this Babish case doesn't happen again? So uh, do you have any, any work or any project or any idea how to prevent from uh, having some populist uh, upsurge again. Let, okay. let, let's continue some other questions and then. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much to the host today and for all of you coming, sharing your experience. Um, my name is Clara Miller Simonson. I'm from the Danish Embassy here in Budapest. Um, 
I would be very interesting on your perspectives uh, on Hungary, but also your experience in relation to how the international society, mostly I would uh, be interested in the EU, can support um, your, your has been supporting your causes. I think diplomatic uh, support was mentioned in relation to Slovenia, but but often uh, we balance um, this area of not becoming a target uh, of the propaganda or even a useful tool in the propaganda of being countries for forcing values on, uh, as an example, Hungary. Um, so, so how would you see uh, specific ways that international societies, the EU, the EU countries could support um, these uh, campaigns or, or uh, the whole um, um, uh, effort in changing uh, these uh, backlashes of democracy without becoming a, a tool in the, in the propaganda? Uh, thank you. Okay, let's continue with Zsuzsa. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Zsuzsa Seleni. Um, I'm Hungarian and I'm looking interested in the Polish case. Uh, you said that the voting blocks are very stable and that there's no expectation that... Um, so so that the political groups, uh, either on the opposition or in the government, make efforts. Um, the demotivate the other side but I if I know well the the voting turnout in Poland is not specifically high so there is actually a lot of people who are not voting at it all. is actually getting higher and higher with every election yeah of course it does because you said that the two blocks or the or opposition and government is very close to each other so obviously the stakes are high so that's the interesting question much more interesting than who is not voting because people will go to vote. And uh, so uh, what is your expectation who, what the political parties can do in order to mobilize people who actually have never voted before? And I think it's a very critical issue because in Hungary, in the last elections, uh, Fidesz was the one that could mobilize people who never ever in their life uh, voted before. So it's a, it's a proof that it's not so obvious that you know it's the, the who is voting is uh, is crucial and this is also the u.s case i mean trump was able to mobilize people who have never voted before so i think it's it's something imp interesting also in in, in the other speakers like uh, like roman and of course for mikulas uh, what is your your next step you know i'm very much interested in of course you failed party that's okay you made it very clear why and well the movement still makes sense because in a couple of weeks uh, the conservative uh, action cpac the super conservative uh, radical conservative uh, meeting uh, will be held in budapest organized by some uh, gngos uh, financed by fidesz party and both babish and y and uh, yansha will actually participate so they are always ready to come back, so you still have a cause. Okay, any other question? Uh, if not, then who would? One more question, sorry. Uh, concerning the Balkan, basically. So can you identify any direct uh, Hungarian intervention in Balkan politics facilitating populist, uh, and in what nature? financial, political, ideological, and so on. The other thing, with regards to civil society, much have been said that uh, we need civil society, champions of civil society in countering a liberal transition, although most recently another kind of phenomena can, can be detected, that illiberal uh, NGOs, illiberal actors of the civil sector, the sector also present, and they are growing, and they are facilitating uh, populist politicians and also advocating for populist uh, ideas and ideals. So how do you see these illiberal civil society actors on the Balkan? Thank you. Obviously, you can comment any any questions. Uh, and who would like to start? Roman, maybe maybe I, I can start with the question from lady from Danish embassy. Uh, indeed, it is international solidarity 
and support, uh, it's very important. I know that the embassies, due to the uh, diplomatic rules, you cannot directly be involved, but uh, international organization and foreign governments uh, can speak out against the propaganda and they can, uh, they can help through the different uh, levels, uh, you know, to fight, uh, to, to make this, uh, to fight against the uh, illiberal leaders and uh, uh, make a pressure on them, you know, if that's uh, uh, becoming a common, then it, it can be the sanctions, can be travel bans, the other forms uh, which can 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 uh, can countries uh, uh, taken. I was also speaking about the EU and how the EU is um, can be powerful in some of the cases to uh, to fight uh, uh, illegal uh, uh, politics inside the EU. It is a little bit problematic outside because you don't have these mechanisms to uh, to do this. Uh, but still, I think uh, on the case of, of, of Serbia, it was shown that it's possible uh, to pressure also those countries which are applying for the uh, full membership, especially those countries which are in the process of the of the integration to the to the uh, to the EU. Um, so it is very important, and it, it, that why that why you you are around. Uh, all the countries, not just the EU, but also outside the EU, to to see what's going on. And the, the, I know that in the Balkan, the coordinations of the countries from the EU is always they are regular and they are trying to be uh, to speak in one language when uh, they secure this kind of illegal, uh, illiberal um, uh, methods. Um, uh, uh, concerning the. Uh, the, the, the best question is about the, uh, per, uh, the, 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 the gentleman who's coming from Helsinki Committee, as I understood from the morning session. Uh, I mean, this is obviously that Orban is very active in the, in the Western Balkan helping. Uh, I mean, you, you, you are, you are keeping Gruevsky here from, from North Macedonia, who should go back home to the prison. Uh, accused and uh, uh, proceeded in the court about the about the corruption and everything, uh, but that's not. That it's not just this that that uh, you are giving uh, as the member of European Union uh, 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 legal protection or the protection of somebody who should be uh, put it in the prison. But it's also the influence which are mainly what I saw also in Slovenia going through the through the media uh, money. Uh, probably you know that, for example, Orban was directly uh, with the with the two million euro financing the the Janez Janša private TV channel and the, and the newspaper. Uh, he stopped now when Janša is not there. But it was not just the money which came to Slovenia uh, to to help uh, his friend who will gather with him uh, uh, with his extreme rightists. Uh, but the, that money went also uh, to the to the North Macedonia, to the Vemera de Pene, Gryoski was the leader uh, before. Um, uh, you can you can see the let's say this partnership with uh, Vucic in Serbia. So uh, we have we have the expression Glicha skup Stricha. That's the expression that those who like each other they are always connected to each other. So in that respect, indeed, it is uh, uh, the influence of Viktor Orban in the Western Balkan is, is huge. For example, I will give you also one example, and this is going together with the, what I was describing, uh, that, that Serbia is the, the far developed in the sense of creation of the great Serbia, what they are calling now the, the Serbian world, is the support of the open Balkan process which is supported by the Orban, one of the few, if not the only one in the European Union, uh, uh, because that's, that's the initiative, uh, reg regional cooperation initiative, uh, 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 find it out uh, uh, from Serbia, and you have, uh, you, uh, you have three countries now in, which is complete alternative to the uh, Berlin process, 
which is the process of the six uh, Western Balkan countries uh, uh, wanted to, to join the European Union. And, and, and it is uh, tailor-made for those six countries how to prepare themselves. So instead of, you know, uh, uh, supporting the Berlin process, he's supporting very egoistic, uh, politically uh, um, uh, orientated project Open Balkan uh, um, in, in the region. So it is huge uh, fingerprints of Viktor Orban as well in the Balkan in the negative sense, I'm, I, I must say. Um, that's it. Thank you. Can we continue? Yeah. Yeah. Can we continue with Tomas? Sure. So the question was what uh, what can politicians do to mobilize those people who do not vote at all? And I think uh, in, in the Polish political discussion, most thought is being put into how to mobilize the potential voters, all those who could possibly vote for us, but may not turn uh, turn on the day of the elections at the station poll. And uh, there's very little thought being put to the people who not vote at all, and possibly uh, because they are not well researched, we really do not know publicly what they think, and there is a suspicion, I guess, that most of them could be only protest voters in case of some radical circumstances that they, uh, that, 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 that then they could decide to go for to, to go to the to the station poll, and then what what peace and civic platform do to mobilize uh, their own uh, electorates? Peace has actually changed electoral laws within recent months. One of the major changes there was to create a, a lot of new station uh, electoral ele election stations, so that. Every voter will, and especially in rural areas, will now will now will now have a shorter way to the electoral station. And peace counts on the fact that if uh, their support is mainly located in rural areas, that that this may mobilize some of the people who would who wouldn't otherwise go to vote. As for uh, civic platform, I think they mostly appeal to women, women and uh, the young, and through, uh, for example, new uh, policies such as there's a, they have a new housing policy and also, also a policy to help uh, young mothers to return to work after giving uh, childbirth. And they count on the fact that, uh, well, they push this narrative that uh, law and justice uh, government is anti-women and anti-young and they want to mobilize in, in a sort of negative, positive way, uh, the, 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 these groups of voters, although uh, with regard to women, this is a tough play because it's not so true that uh, law and justice is uh, not supported by women. It's like uh, there's a very little difference between the support of the government of, and the opposition between men and women. There are only the differences are only visible with regard to the most radical parties and on the far right there's this Confederacia party which is right to peace and they actually their support is definitely much higher among men and then there's uh, Razem party on the left which is the the furthest to the left in Poland and their support is higher among women but as far as uh, the main parties go there is no such difference so I think. That's what I can share here. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, what's next? <laughs> okay, I think there were more questions. First was uh, what to do uh, so that it will, won't happen again. Uh, I think it will happen again. Uh, I think it's very probable that Andrei Babish is, will be next prime minister of Czech Republic because uh, the new government is quite uh, incompetent and uh, very bad in communication and also in very uh, tough situation. But uh, either also when it happened, there the, the situation will be different because we have this very good unpopulist, uh, anti-populist president, which will be uh, just balance uh, to Babish. And uh, I think that uh, there is no uh, easy solution to this problem. I think it's a long-term game. 
And there are two, I think, most important uh, aspects of this. First is that you need to, to build really strong civil society because the more there are active and educated citizens, the, the, more, the better is their power. And uh, this is one pillar. And second is that you definitely need to, to get co uh, competent and honest and strong people to politics. I think this is maybe the biggest problem. Uh, so the question is, what stories, what values, what leaders will move people to care, to make sacrifices for democracy, to go to politics? Uh, uh, our first president of Czechoslovakia, Tomáš Garik Masaryk, in 1918 said, so now we have the democracy and where are the Democrats? Yeah, And it's, it's the basic problem. You cannot do democracy without Democrats. So it's a matter of educating uh, people to be democrat Democrats, to understand the problem, to take responsibility, to not have the victimhood mindset. Uh, it's it's long-term game. Then there was a question, question of what can do EU uh, for these uh, initiatives and or in fight of propaganda, if I understood it correctly. Uh, I think the most important is just do the great laws for defend of uh, liberal, liberal democracy and also enforce them. These are laws for uh, for yeah media sphere. Uh, these are laws for conflict of interests. Because if there would be great laws in Czech Republic, it won't be possible to have uh, to have prime minister with such a great conflict of, in of interests. The owner of a media house, the owner of big uh, companies. But but we had terrible laws, and this is one thing you should you could you can help. And a second thing is. I, I don't think that you can give more money to, to these initiatives because it's counterproductive. It's, uh, if, if we took some money from abroad, it will be, yeah, you know, very big backfire. But I think you can support NGOs that are making uh, talent, and, talent and education for, for leaders. I think it's very, uh, to, to to find some systemic way to, to strengthen development of leaders, of local leaders, of NGO leaders, I think it's very important. And me personally, it, it helped a lot uh, when I was uh, in, in part of some talent program. And third question was, yeah, it was, uh, what are my next steps? Uh, so uh, first, I would like to finish my studies. I, I uh, was pushed to, to end, to end because of million moments, then, Middle Moments is still working in Czech Republic and they are criticizing new government, they are educating the society and I think they will play an uh, important role uh, if Babish will took to power again. And I also think there is very huge potential for this movement of, or this idea or this technique uh, to, to go abroad, to inspire uh, people in other countries because I think it's, it is a re replicable uh, idea. And, uh, so I'm I'm uh, working on book where I will try to uh, be more precise in what happened and in my experiences in how to how to maybe reply uh, this success story. But I hope that one time we will have uh, million moments for democracy in every country. <laughs> so we will see. Thank you so much. Um, before the concluding remarks, I would like to say three things. First of all, thank you for coming to our conference and being with us uh, today. And also thank you for the audience uh, here in person and online who followed this uh, conference. The second uh, thing that uh, I would like to say also thank you for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation because uh, uh, of its generous support which made this conference possible. And the third thing that just in the middle of May, end of May, we will publish an edited volume, which will summarize the most important um, um, take, uh, most important things and most important things, uh, what we've learned from this uh, conference and from the workshop, which we had uh, yesterday. So please visit our website uh, soon uh, and also read this uh, edited volume. 
And obviously, I also ask the authors who are here in the room that please uh, be very um, confident with the deadline. <laughs> And now I would like to ask Zsuzsa Szelényi, who is the former member of the Hungarian Parliament and member of our Hungarian Europe Society, to say some concluding or farther remarks. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was really a quite a fascinating day and uh, a super cool speakers so thank you very much for all of uh, your contribution um what uh we can say of such an ambitious um at the end of such an ambitious program uh, is that we do live in a time when we are in an autocratization uh, process globally we after 10 12 years let's say hungary's case it's completely clear the whole globe is not democratizing, but it's actually autocratizing. And uh, thinking about how to resist this or how to get out of this is really a huge challenge. Uh, the Central and Eastern European countries are actually specifically sensitive to this. And I think that today speakers uh, prove this in, in many, many examples. Because uh, we are 30 years uh, of democracies uh, except the Czechs who had Masaryk earlier. Uh, you you are just very, a bit luckier than, <laughs> than others. But anyway, uh, 30 years is not so long. And uh, we really are in a very different trend than when actually some of us started our political activism when we were at your age. So, right, exactly. So, um, so this is a difficult uh, period, and this is a diff uh, the sensitive uh, zone, a periphery of Europe, even though some of the leaders, like Hungary's prime minister, believe we are in the core of the world, we are actually at the periphery of the West. So maybe this is why uh, Eastern opening is such a big issue. So all these things really mean a fundamental change. Uh, today was not about the day to talk about the war, but obviously uh, uh, the, f the fight uh, of the autocrats or the demonstration of the strengths of the autocrats is also uh, showed itself with the uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. So this is really a fundamental change of the time that we are in and that we do not have clear strategies and ideas how to how to change it back towards a more democratic environment if we still believe that democracy, liberal democracy, is the best form of a community where people can have the best life. Uh, our countries in this region have different level of autocratization, uh, but even in the Czechs, the super cool Czechs or the Slovenians, do have to make significant effort to be resilient to autocratization trend. And in many countries, Hungary is actually the kind of negative example. I met Nika Kovac, the, the uh, person who organized or kind of face of the 8th March movement in Slovenia. Uh, and the, they, they every day told that we don't want to be like Hungary. And I think this is also kind of a slogan in, in the Czech Republic. And we don't have Slovak representative here, but there are elections in Slovakia soon, and they are really in trouble in these days. And I hope you are going to help them because political parties are so fragmented that they might not be able to resist uh, to the comeback of Robert Fico, who uh, is a, one of the criminals of our region. So, if I can say so. Um, so the resilience and resistance is not exactly the same. And obviously, there are more problems in countries like in Hungary or Poland, when, when the autocratization is at a more advanced stage, or it, there is already an advanced stage. And um, political activism has a high price. 
So you also mentioned that is a sacrifice for democracy. I find it very interesting that even in, in your country, you believe that it's, you have to make sacrifice. Maybe probably this is the essence of democracy that we actually have to uh, make sacrifice for it. It's not evident and uh, you have to give up something. You give up your studies for a couple of years. Uh, and if, if it's an autocracy, then in Hungary, then working for democracy is actually an existential issue. So it is a is a risky thing, not necessarily your life are in danger or your we are not uh, facing prosecution, but we definitely uh, many people in Hungary who work for democracy have to see uh, existential problems, uh, or, which is a high risk. So entering politics, a political activism is a risky issue because you have to take care of yourself and your family. So, uh, what, wherever you go, and it was very interesting also to listen to many of you, either from civil society or political parties, there is always kind of discussion who can do the best, you know, who are, whose actions are more efficient. And in Slovenia and, the, and in the Czech Republic, there were actually NGOs or even civic movements out of nowhere who could support but at the end of the day is political parties who who represent uh, power and who are able to change the regime so it's a very interesting dilemma what you describe and it's a question if with a case of every movement when there is a certain uh, level of success of a movement how to enter a more concrete politics uh, should you then run for office should you use your uh, learning uh, points, your your movement, the people, your resources, your ideas, uh, your personalities, your faces for uh, political uh, progress. So it's not only your issue. Maybe you did too early, but you know, timing is very complicated. But it's a question for Nika Kovac, and it's a question in 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 many other countries. So that these are these are if very interesting issues, and therefore, if you are a pro-democracy activist, either as, an, as a civilian or a political person, you need political savvy. You need, you should be smart because actually the opponents are quite smart as well. So if you want to win, it's not only sacrifice, but you also have to really be smart. You have to be able to make alliances and uh, you have to think strategically uh, from one step to the other or even you know, in long term, if if you are if you really want to make an alternative, many of us of you use this term providing an alternative, which is lacking very much in Hungary, in Poland, as you said, in political parties are really they the only strategy they have that they have to get together, which is the case in Hungary for twelve years. But what why is for you know why the alliance is for, and this is not without reason. Because actually, with the kind of crisis of liberal democracy, we do not have the necessary good stories. We, there is a crisis which everyone knows, we also admit it, but we don't really know how to, what to say, what's the new narrative, what's the new vision. So the question of the key question of this colloquium, this workshop is actually very, very relevant. We are all experimenting, when, with whatever position we are. And well, experimenting is risky. Uh, it's also super exciting. It's intellectually very, very exciting. And one thing is what you mentioned that we have to learn from each other. I actually think that we also have to work, work together. So learning is really very important, but, um, but we can also support each other. It's not without reason that Viktor Orban is organizing the CPAC conference in Budapest and bringing all people from Jared Bolsonaro's son to Babish and, and Americans uh, together because they actually uh, share a lot of things. I think so, any of the uh, concept, uh, uh, which I didn't hear this morning, but I, I know quite a lot of that, is, uh, is which describes the Hungarian a set of ideology of the Hungarian autocratic regime is actually very uh, easy to sell. It's a very tempting uh, combo of ideas, which actually works uh, from Brazil to India to Hungary everywhere. So 
so the, the task is fundamental and it's, it's huge. But of course, uh, we do not have to give up ever. And also it's very important to say it in this country, Hungary, that we should never give up because um, actually Viktor Orban gave a, an interview a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago to a very conservative uh, journalist uh, who he collected from all over the world. Maybe many of them of you uh, read uh, one of them, uh, Rod Dreher, described what what this background discussion was. So and they were talking a lot about Russia and Orban made a sentence, which I think can be a motto for all of us. Uh, even manipulated elections can be lost. I find it very telling and I, I think it's a super positive comment. Uh, he obviously thought of uh, Vladimir Putin, but obviously this is true. Um, one of the things is that electoral auto, uh, uh, integrity is completely fallen. This is the first what autocrats attack all the time because they all organize elections because uh, in the 21st century, you cannot be even an autocrat without elections, without some kind of legitimacy. But obviously, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of um, uh, not fair and not free elections uh, can demonstrate um, a lot of obstacle for anyone who wants to make an alternative. But if even manipulated elections can be lost, that it's really a very, very positive story. And I think the European Union and European countries can do a lot for this. So I think learning about and creating a new set of expectations, how elections should look like, is the thing what the uh, European countries should uh, really reflect about, because I think it's just a complete nonsense that we regard every elections the same value. And the other thing, uh, all these autocrats, and I think I, I just try to answer some of your questions, uh, the autocrats who all demand more respect for themselves, I think this is also kind of commonality, uh, basically pushing out uh, other countries, support, funding, cooperation for those who actually uh, use it for something good for democracy, while they are actually uh, using a lot of resources for alliance building. So I think what you said, that the EU should actually support uh, a democracy activists in every possible form, and uh, their training and their capacity building is uh, is really something strategic. But I, I, I also would say any kind of pro-democracy work is worth for support, not only moral support, but financial support, because this is how the autocrats pull out the air uh, from democracy in this country. But we have the positive note, so I'd like to conclude this wonderful day of discussions and. I think that's lunchtime, but thank you very much.